Morning, Mr. Jackson. Now, you've been referred to me by your GP, and I'm the first neurologist you've seen, I think. That's right. I think my GP's got some ideas about what my problem may be, but he sent me here, you know, to double check. Okay. I've got some notes here with his referral letter, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me in your own words the symptoms you first noticed. Well, there were several things which started early last year. They don't sound too bad individually, but together they were affecting me quite a bit. I guess the worst thing was, well, feeling absolutely shattered, you know, feeling exhausted most of the time, even when I'd not been doing much. I'd never suffered from depression, but I started feeling a bit down. There wasn't a specific trigger. And any physical pain then? Well, my right leg, it didn't ache exactly, but there was a real stiffness which made walking slower. And my neck was affected too. Again, not a pain, but more like a tightness. Yeah, that's how it felt, and it still does. Um, I started to get constipated too, and I'd never had a problem with that before. I see. And I noticed other things around the same time, like my handwriting. I used to write strong, big letters, everyone always said how distinctive it was. But it was shrinking. Weird how it had changed. I'm right-handed and I began to notice from time to time there was like, well, a spasm in that hand. It didn't happen often, but it was worrying. The worst thing though was something I noticed when I was in its standing position. You know, washing up or shaving. I'd suddenly feel really unstable on my feet. That must have been frightening. Yeah, I was always scared of toppling backwards. And I gather you've recently started to experience other symptoms? Yeah, this last month or so. It's funny, I used to love cooking, testing out different ingredients and stuff, but my sense of smell's just gone. I don't like preparing meals nearly as much. Then, something which drives me mad is that I keep forgetting things. I used to have such a good memory, and the really frustrating thing, especially for someone who was never exactly quiet is, that people keep on asking me to speak louder, but I just can't seem to raise the volume now. My mouth feels full of saliva too. It, it, it seems to build up more, so I'm wondering if that's got anything to do with it. Any physical activities you're finding hard? Oh yeah, driving's hard, so I don't use the car anymore. I can still use keys to lock doors, though sometimes it's tricky. But buttoning up cardigans and shirts is impossible now. It's so fiddly. I'm getting an electric toothbrush too, cause the manual one's so difficult. I'm ashamed to admit my wife insists on cutting up my food too, when she sees me struggling. Especially when things like, er, steak. And you went on to consult other GPs? Yeah, I saw two doctors in the same practice for a second opinion. The first mistakenly thought it was a trapped nerve and the next sent me for a facial, saying it was probably a frozen shoulder. That was wrong. So he then thought it might be carp, carpal tunnel syndrome affecting my wrist. They were just investigating possible causes. Yeah, fair enough. And I'm hoping it's nothing serious. I mean, I don't think it's a brain tumor or anything. But I have started to worry that it might be multiple sclerosis. You know, given the symptoms. Then my granddad had dementia. I desperately hope it's not that. I don't think so. And uh, looking at the tests you've had, a blood test and... A thyroid functional test. But I never heard anything back from that, so I'm assuming it was negative. Okay, well, I'm going to look at your notes again. Extract 2, questions 13 to 24. You hear a doctor talking to a patient called Metagal. For questions 13 to 24, complete the following notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes.
Good morning, Doctor. Good morning. Please be seated. Can you tell me about your problem? Doctor, since last year, I've been having double vision whenever I wake up in the morning. The problem lasts for one hour after I wake. When I close my eyes, the double vision dissipates. Over the past month, the double vision problem has worsened in intensity and frequency. I approached a local hospital in my town, and they referred me to the emergency department for an urgent MRI to investigate for possible aneurysm. There, I had a normal MRI and I was discharged to go home. By the next week, the double vision improved, although at present, I'm still experiencing constant diplopia. In the past, whenever I saw two objects, they were very far apart in horizontal plane, but now the objects appear much closer together. I've stopped driving. I've also discontinued my job due to the diplopia problem. There's no temporal fluctuation to the double vision. Very recently, over the past week, I've developed supraorbital pain on the right side. Your age? 51, Doctor. Do you have any problems with swallowing or dysphagia? No, Doctor. Any weakness, numbness, tingling or any neurological issues? No, Doctor. Do you have any difficulty in speaking or dysarthria? No, Doctor. Are you on any medication or allergic to any medicines? No, Doctor. Do you drink or smoke? I do not drink, but I smoke. Is there any family history of any illness? My mother died of a stroke when she was 90. My father had colon cancer. Well, your physical examination report shows your BP 124 over 76, heart rate 101, respiratory rate is 20. Your recent MRI report shows a questionable 3 mm aneurysm of the medial left supraclinoid internal corduroy artery. There is absolutely no abnormality on the right side. The blood flow patterns are normal and there is no blood vessel abnormalities. I think you have developed a condition myasthenia gravas or other disorder. Your right lid process. You have left gaze diplopia. The pupils are equal and reactive to light. Your neurological investigation is absolutely normal. There are possibilities of other extraocular abnormalities. You have horizontal diplopia in both directions, but there is no vertical diplopia. You have monocular diplopia. Is it curable, Doctor? Yes, of course. I would advise you to have a craniotomy and clipping done. This is a surgery performed to treat an aneurysm. However, you have to be very careful after the surgery because a rupture may cause you to lose your vision. I think I should go for this surgery at any cost, Doctor. You are right, Mr. Metagle. That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear an ED nurse talking to the relative of a patient who has been recently admitted. Did you want to talk to me, Miss Tanaka? Oh, yes, you see, I just wanted to let you know that my father, well, as you know, he's recently been diagnosed with dementia. 
Most of the time it's not an issue and his spats never last long. It's just that I wanted to prepare you. Sometimes he's really not himself. Ah, okay, Miss Tanaka. I think I understand. Can your father become aggressive? Yes.、Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's just that he gets frustrated sometimes. He can't remember things, and I think it's scary for him.、Uh -huh. He was never ever like this before his dementia, and those periods, well, they really don't reflect his true character. Of course. Thanks for letting me know. You hear an obstetrician describe a caesarean section to a pregnant patient. Labor can progress differently for different people. In some circumstances, if labor is longer than expected, and if we detect that the baby is distressed, then we may have to consider an emergency caesarean section. It's a procedure that we perform in theatre, and it is carried out under spinal or epidural anaesthetic, so that you don't feel anything, but you will be awake. A screen is placed across your body, so you don't have to see what's being done. We make an incision in your tummy and womb, just under your bikini line, to remove your baby, and then stitch up the wound. It takes around forty minutes, and your birth partner can be there at all times. Does that make sense? You hear a GP and his practice nurse discussing their yearly schedule. In September, we'll have a lot of new patients, as the first-year university students will all register during freshers.、Uh, yes,、uh, we were really run off our feet last year, weren't we? Yep, it was a madhouse. Do you think we should hire agency staff to help out for the first couple of weeks this time around? Well, I think part of the problem was that last year Dr. Igwe and Nurse Fletcher were both away.、Uh, Dr. Igwe went to Costa Rica, and Nurse Fletcher had the flu.、Oh, right, I remember. Well, we can't do much to prevent staff illness. No, but we can ask people to avoid booking time off in those first three weeks. Okay, I'll send an email out today. You hear a nurse prepare a patient for a flu shot. Good morning, Mr. Henderson. Hi.、Um, Doctor Ray has recommended that you get a flu immunization shot before you're discharged. I've got the injection ready to give you. Are you allergic to anything? Uh, I'm only allergic to latex and penicillin.、Um, I don't know if I want the flu shot.、Oh. The last time I got the shot, I got sick. I'm sorry that happened to you. What kind of symptoms did you have after that last flu shot?、Uh, I got a runny nose and a headache, and my arm felt like someone punched me. Ah,、uh, sometimes the flu shot can cause reactions like a sore injection site and headache.、Uh, Other common symptoms include being tired,、uh, muscle and joint aches, shivering, and fever. All of these symptoms can be seen with the flu, but the shot can't give you the flu. You hear a doctor talk to a patient about her injury.
Good morning, Mrs. Bowder. I'll be your doctor taking care of your cut there. But what exactly happened? Oh, it's embarrassing, really. You see, I was just trying to chop some tomatoes for dinner, and the knife accidentally slipped. Oh, I'm so clumsy. I hope it doesn't hurt too much to stitch back up. Well, we're going to numb the area now with a shot of lidocaine. You'll feel a poke of the needle and a slight burn, but afterwards the area should be numb and you'll feel nothing during the procedure. Oh, good. We should be finished in about ten minutes. Good. How many stitches will I need? And, and how long will I have to stay in? I'm really conscious about my hands, so I hope I don't have a scar. I will only know for sure once I finish suturing, but by my estimation... You might require at least four to five sutures. Oh. They'll have to stay in for five to ten days, and you'll need to come back in to get them removed. Right. <laughs> I'll do my best to try and line up the edges to create as little scarring as possible. Thank you. But I can't guarantee there will be nothing there. You hear a trainee nurse asking a senior colleague about the treatment for a patient with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. I haven't treated anyone with COPD before. What would we need to do differently? One of the most important things would be to make sure to prescribe oxygen at levels between 88 to 92%. Okay, so why would that be necessary? If he's having trouble breathing, shouldn't we prescribe higher oxygen levels? Most patients receive oxygen at levels between 94 and 98 percent. Well, in healthy individuals, a rise in carbon dioxide would result in an increased drive to breathe in order to eliminate the excess gas. Right. However, in some patients with COPD, this response is blunted, and their main mechanism for respiratory drive is controlled by the level of oxygen in the body instead. If the level of oxygen given to a COPD patient is increased too much, it can actually reduce the stimulus to breathe and cause hypoventilation, resulting in an increase in CO2. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. Questions 31 to 42. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. Now look at extract one. Extract one, questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with Dr. Christine Erickson, who's talking about her research supporting non-fasting lipid blood tests for cholesterol. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Hello and welcome to Health Research Roundup. For decades, people have been asked to fast before they have blood tests to check cholesterol levels. However, a new research report from an international group of experts suggests that this is not necessary. To discuss this research, my guest today is Christine Erickson from Copenhagen University Hospital, who was a lead author of the study. Christine, welcome. Thank you very much. So why did we ever ask people to fast for blood lipids for your blood fats? Well, if you ask me, I don't really know, except for that's what we've been doing for so many years. I really tried to read the literature and find some very scientific evidence supporting that it is superior to just taking a random non-fasting blood sample as we do now. And I had problems finding the evidence. There's a lot of arguments people put forward for why you should use fasting versus non-fasting, but really solid evidence that is better, I can't find it. So was this a tradition rather than science? I think so, yes. I mean, you can ask me why did it start? I think that some of the early studies, the original publications way back, said that they used fasting samples and therefore everybody thought you had to do that without really thinking why. But those early researchers may have had good reason to do it that way, but there's nothing I've seen that said it had to be done that way. And there's all this evidence now from Canada and the US, two excellent studies, one in children and one in adults. And then we have a lot of studies from Copenhagen, and they all show that when you just look at people that eat and drink whatever they usually do, and you take a lipid panel, cholesterol, triglycerides, a very common fat in the blood, then they don't really change very much in response to when you have been eating. So there is a difference? Yeah, the difference is in millimoles per litre. So it goes up by about 0.3 millimoles per litre. However, in clinical practice, when you look at triglycerides, you're interested in whether it increases are uh, one or two millimoles, not 0.3 millimoles. So that's what's clinically relevant. And even with a bad form of cholesterol, that's not going to make the difference between whether or not they put you on medication? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we provide data in this report where we did direct measurement and after fasting and in about 6,000 people and the correlation between the two methods was, I can't see the difference. It looks exactly the same. So you moved over in Denmark to this official recommendation about seven years ago. So what's happened since then? Have there been any issues because of undiagnosed cholesterol levels? No, everybody was happy right away. Even the laboratories that didn't change right away, they were pushed by patients because there were reports in the media telling them that at Copenhagen University Hospital, we're doing non-fasting, so everyone wanted to do it. And I can say today, patients, clinicians, laboratories, everyone's happy. Everyone likes it because it's so much simpler. And patients like it because they can go when it suits them to the pathologist, so they're more likely to turn up for their blood tests? Yes, of course. I don't have fantastic good numbers for you, but certainly you hear from so many colleagues that people don't go to have their lipid test because it's so complicated to fast. And then they have to go to work, to have an important meeting, and they can't do this in the morning. But now, doing a random non-fasting, you can come whenever it suits you. And very briefly, is there any circumstance where you should have a fasting blood fat level done? Well, this recommendation, it's 21 world experts, many from Europe, the US, and one from Australia also. And of course, when you have so many experts, there's always someone that thinks there's certain situations. We list a few where you can do. For example, for patients with diabetes, the fasting requirements might be an important safety issue because of problems with high... Now look at extract 2, questions 37 to 42. You hear the monologue of a physician giving a lecture on the different types of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. You have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42.
The two main categories of lymphoma are Hodgkin lymphoma and non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Non-Hodgkin lymphoma is a large group of diseases with different symptoms, treatments, and outcomes. The appropriate name of the type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma may include a number of descriptive terms that can be difficult to understand. Lymphomas arise from lymphocytes, a type of white blood cell, which are of two types, T-cells and B-cells. Both help in killing infectious agents, however, in slightly different ways. Based on the type of lymphocyte turned into the cancer cell, the patients may have a T-cell or a B-cell lymphoma. B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma is the more common type. There are many different types of B-cell and T-cell lymphomas, each behaving in a different way. Pathologists performing biopsy of the tumor define the cancers in terms of grade. High-grade lymphoma cells look quite different from normal cells. They tend to grow aggressively. Low-grade lymphomas have cells that look much more similar to normal cells and multiply gradually. Intermediate-grade lymphomas fall somewhere in the middle. The behavior of these types is also described as indolent and aggressive. What the pathologist describes as a high-grade or intermediate-grade lymphoma usually grows fast in the body, so these two types are considered aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Surprisingly, aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma often responds better to treatment, and many people with aggressive non-Hodgkin lymphoma are cured if they are diagnosed early. The most common kind of aggressive lymphoma is diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. On the other hand, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma grows gradually and these lymphomas are therefore called indolent non-Hodgkin lymphoma. This group of non-Hodgkin lymphoma doesn't give rise to too many symptoms, but they are also long-standing and are less likely to be cured. The most common kind of indolent lymphoma is follicular lymphoma. At times, indolent lymphomas can transform into more aggressive. The majority of lymphomas are nodal lymphomas. That means they originate in the lymph nodes. However, it is possible for lymphomas to arise from anywhere else. When the lymphoma is mainly present in nodes, it is called nodal disease. Occasionally, most of the lymphoma may be in an organ that is not a part of the lymph system, such as the skin, the stomach, or the brain. In such condition, the lymphoma is referred to as extranodal. Therefore, nodal and extranodal refer to the primary site of the disease. A lymphoma can develop in a lymph node and then involve other parts at a later stage. However, in such a case, it is still considered a nodal lymphoma but is said to have extranodal involvement. In follicular lymphoma, the cancer cells arrange themselves in spherical clusters called follicles. In diffuse non-Hodgkin lymphoma, the cells are spread around without any clustering. Most of the time, low-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks follicular, and intermediate or high-grade non-Hodgkin lymphoma looks diffuse in biopsy. Non-Hodgkin lymphomas are also described as common or rarer based on the statistics of the new cases every year. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.